like every other dog. None of the gauges work. Man dodge sucks. All right, it's time to fil film an educational video, the worst kind of videos, but they're handy when you're building projects. So, this is what the 12 valve looks like inside the truck. It's really hard to show people what you need to do because it's so cluttered and there's so much junk in there. But the easiest thing is to have one on the ground, which I do have. And then we can explain some other things at the same time. So, People who are looking to do a come and swap, they're going to need this. So, first gen, that's the square body Cummins, 89 to 93. 89 to 91 and a half is a non-intercooled, which means you'll recognize by the goofy pipe that comes from the intake and goes directly to the turbo. That is a non-intercooled model. They're fine, they're just as reliable, but the cylinder heads are different, and the cylinder heads, uh, the, the injectors are bigger. You're limited on the horsepower you can make out of those without changing the head, um, but they're still just a reliable engine. They smoke like a freight train. Um, they'll have a jet rag five-speed behind them. All the first gens come with a jet rag five-speed. They're okay, they're not as desirable as the next model. The 91 and a half to 93 is the intercooled one, and I have an example of that one right here this would be a 91 and a half or 91 and a half to 93 intercooled model so the pipe comes out instead of going towards the turbo the pipe comes out this side and goes around and the turbo boosts all the way to the uh intercooler it's uh the v pumps are easy to identify that's a v pump the injection lines come out the back of the pump i'll light that up right there so all the injection lines come out the back of the pump. And then a P pump, which is a 94 to 98, is this one. The big, dirty P7100 pump. And they're more desirable for a lot of people for horsepower. But I find them a little harder starting. And especially in the winter. So I prefer the VE pump model. Conveniently, I have a couple of these right now on the go for projects. So it's all good. So second gen is 94 to 2002. Uh, 94 to 98 and a half is a 12 valve. 12 valve is easily identified by the, uh, the six individual valve covers versus the one big valve cover um, on the 24 valves and everything. They're uh, probably the most desirable engine. The most desirable of all the Cummins engines is the uh, P-Pump 12 valve. The most capable of horsepower, anyway, uh, in a mechanical form. 98 to 2002 is a 24 valve. That's electronic. You're dealing with uh, computer and wiring and all that stuff. I I stay behind. I, I stay from there up. I don't touch anything like that. I've owned a couple of them. They're okay. but So in these ones, you can get a... Five speed, I think all the way up to 2000 or something, or maybe it's 98 and a half. You can get a six speed, uh, what, I can't remember what it's called now, all of a sudden, uh, NV5600. The 94 to 98s come with an NV4500, which is a five speed transmission. They're the, they're the desirable one. The fives and the sixes are the desirable transmissions. You can bolt them up to the older models, but they, they never came with them. So that's just the way it goes. And then the third gen is a 2003 to 2006. Well, 2006 and a half. Uh, after 2006 and a half, they went to the 6.7 the Cummins. But uh, yeah, that's a common rail. They're uh, a different injection system than the 98 and a half to the 2002 24 valves. Um, they're all computer controlled. It doesn't make a difference which one of those you buy. If you're going to convert... If you're going to buy one of them to convert it to a 12 valve, you're going to buy the 98 to 2002. If you're buying the 
2003 to 2006, you leave them alone. The common rail is a very good engine. It's just you're going to be dealing with computers and wiring. The reason I'm showing you this board isn't to educate on the, the engine. It's the complicated nature of swapping a Cummins into a Ford. That's the issue. So for this one, luckily, I have an example right here, just sitting here, wait, ready to go. So this one's already ready and set up, set up to swap into a Ford. I have the luxury of having the old silver one over there as an example so I know exactly what I need to do. And because I've done this before, I'm good at it. Um, I built this bracket, but you can buy this. Um, it's an alternator adapter bracket to put a Ford alternator on the Cummins. You don't have to do this, but that way you don't mess with the wiring on the Ford. You just plug it all in and it just works. Uh, that bracket's cheap. I think it's a hundred bucks online. I built this one because I had a brand new one in the silver Ford. Uh, you don't have to change any of the other stuff in the front end. It all stays the same. Uh, this thermostat housing points the other way factory. There we go. So it points towards the middle and I cut it and moved it. Now it points that way to fit in the Ford and work with the factory Ford radiator. Uh, you don't have to do this. You can buy this part, but once again, when you're doing it on the cheap, you build everything yourself. Next, turbos. There's your factory turbo. As you can see, it's mounted on a factory manifold and you have to modify all this stuff if you're going to do a swap so that drain line the reason you have to do this is because the ford heater box is right here so this exhaust points right at your heater box you have to do this there's no getting around it unless you're deleting your whole heat and air conditioning system so this is the updated one this is the third gen so like i was showing before on the whiteboard the 2000 three to 2006 common rail exhaust manifold. You can buy these online, they're not expensive. And you need that because instead of coming down off the side and pointing outside, this one points downwards and at the back, which is great because the air box is right here now. So now we're set, now we're clear of everything. But you can reuse, you can reuse your oil feed line, but you can't reuse the drain. So as you can see, the engine mounts for putting this in the Ford get in the way of uh, you know your factory drain and the height of the turbo changes. So you have to build a line. Oh, you just take the factory one and cut it down and modify it. You could, I don't know, you could probably buy a generic one that someone already built, but the easiest thing for me is just to build one because I'm not afraid to build one. So there it is. Uh, this fitting in the block, this just spins. You can turn this wherever you want. Uh, that's easy. And then you're going to have to delete this. This one, actually, I should take it back. This was an automatic. And on an automatic, it would have had an oil cooler for the transmission right behind the turbo here. And it would have had an extra line coming out, but I welded that shut. So this is where your heater hose goes. And then this is where your other heater hose goes to go to the Ford heater, uh, heater box. Pretty straightforward stuff, pretty easy. Uh, this one is still set up factory, as you can see. It's still got the lines going over top, but these lines going over top make it harder to work on, and they're always, they always rot and crack and split right where the clamps hold them. So in a Dodge, this would be, the firewall would be right here and your little short lines. But on the Ford, they're not like that. The lines aren't right here. They're over here kind of thing. So. It's just the way it goes. Next, that is the diesel conversion specialist adapter plate that I had to buy. Um, it comes with wicked instructions. You know, not a lot, a lot, not a lot to look into. It it's pretty straightforward. You need a six liter starter, six liter Ford starter. Um, the directions that come with this stuff are excellent. I didn't need them because I'd already done this before. But you do have to trim a small chunk out of the block. It's nothing big, but as you can see where the starter mounts, that, that little piece is trimmed. I'll see if I can get a better angle of it right here. Yeah, see, this one's not trimmed. There'd be a little chunk missing out of it right at the back. So it's really nice having these engines as an example to one another. It really makes it easy to do these swaps. Um, I'm gonna sell this P-Pump, it's going away. Um, I'm not a fan of the P-Pumps, and I spent a lot of money on this conversion of this uh, 
this other one. I'm going to keep the other one, put it in this tr in my uh, black dually one ton. When the 7.3 IDI, um, when it fails, it's, it's, it's got a lot of clicks, it's tired, it's going to run until it blows up. And when it blows up, that thing is ready to drop in. Uh, the hardest part of this job isn't even the engine. It's the intercooler. The intercooler, a lot of meat has to be cut out. So ahead of time, order yourself, if you're doing an OBS Ford swap, order yourself a 6 liter or a 7.3 power stroke intercooler. The power strokes had an intercooler after 99, I believe. It might be after 98. But you need one of those intercoolers. Either one will fit. It doesn't matter. This is a 6 liter one. Um, they're what were available when I bought them. And they do not bolt right in. They are a struggle. In my previous video, when I put an engine in this truck, I showed that you have to gut pretty much the whole front end to get the intercooler to fit in there. Uh, it is what it is. This is the hardest part of the swap. If you choose to not put an intercooler in, you can run it exactly like a non-intercooled model. You can do that. You can just tie the turbo directly to the intake. The problem with that is you'll make less power and more heat you're, you're just, you're deliberately limiting yourself, but it does save a giant step in the process. What else is a conversion issue? Um, the power steering lines, this is another easy one. Oh, this one doesn't have the pump on, the pump's on the ground. So this one, this one on the factory Ford one, or on the factory Cummins, is the return. All you do is put a hose on it to the, uh, the power steering pump on the, or the actual steering box on the truck. This one, this lower one, is the pressure outlet. You cut the hose, you cut the metal part off of the line, and you can weld an adapter. This is something you can buy once again, but if you're doing it on the cheap, you're going to do it yourself. Uh, it's always a matter of how much you want to spend. So this is the line. I cut it off. You can cut it off wherever you want. It's going to end up getting cut right about there, I would imagine. And I'm going to weld on an adapter. It'll look something like this. Um, it'll be a JIC adapter and then you just get a hydraulic hose made. It's very cheap. It'll probably cost you 30 bucks, um, with the female ends of this on both ends. And you'll have to cut the line off the steering box as well. That had a Ford hose on it. And then you weld that fitting on that one. Once again, you don't have to do this. This, if this sounds complicated, all you have to do is buy the line. But if you're trying to save money, that is one way of doing it. Uh, the downpipe off the turbo, this is a four inch. You have to buy that. And you're going to end up denting the firewall or pushing in the firewall to clear this exhaust. I suggest header wrapping the pipe on the way down. It keeps the heat off the starter. I have torched a starter on the silver one and had to uh, header wrap that one. It's done. Uh, another one for clearance is you have to clearance behind the engine because the firewall would be right about here. So you have to push up the firewall a little bit. Uh, Peg did it over at zip ties with a uh, bottle jack and lumber. He just pushed it up. That was the smarter way. I did it with a bar and a sledgehammer on this one and it looks like crap and I did a bad job, but lesson learned on the next one, I'm going to do it beforehand. That actually is in the instructions from diesel conversion specialist. I'm not sponsored by them or anything it's just it is what it is uh i bought the kit last time it was really good on that silver truck it just bolted right in so i bought the same kit again to have for this one it came with all the bolt up everything and it's good instructions i feel it important to do the rear seal while you've got it apart this is a brand new rear seal in this one uh i have a front seal too i haven't changed it yet it's not leaking so i'm probably not going to the front seal is relatively easy to do in the truck uh, what else is on my list here? Uh, the throttle connections are relatively easy on the VE pump. You just take the factory Ford throttle connection, hook it up right here, and it pulls on the throttle right there. Uh, the fuel system is exactly the same. You can tie right into the factory lift pump. That's extremely easy stuff. If you want to put sensors in or if you want to put an oil pressure gauge separate, this is your oil pressure port right here. Yeah, right above the engine mount is the oil pressure port. So these things are all relatively easy to do. Uh, it's all just a matter of effort. You can buy the kits to do all of this. Now, to my understanding, the kit 
to do everything. The kit that does all of this, where you don't have to build anything, was $4,500 American. Uh, the kit I bought, which was just the adapter plate and the engine mounts, was just under $2,000 with shipping. That's a big difference in price when I can do the rest of it relatively cheap or for free. Um, you will need a different belt, but that's dependent on whether you have the, like my, I built this. So this adapter to put this alternator on really changes the belt. Your, your belt length is going to vary based on if you buy one, uh, with their, uh, their fancy adapter. Uh, another one is the flywheel, which I don't have yet. It's at a machine shop, but the factory Dodge flywheel from certain years has the right bolt pattern for an IDI clutch. If you have an older 7.3 IDI diesel, but the power stroke has a different bolt pattern. So if it's, you're replacing one in a power stroke and you want to use the clutch from the power stroke, you have to get the flywheel drilled and you also have to get the flywheel hollowed out to put in a different pilot bearing to go into your Ford transmission. That is something I actually have on hand. So I'll get the number right off the box right now. I want to make this complete so you have a pretty good idea of what all is necessary to do this swap. Another thing is you have to move your transmission and transfer case back two inches. Something to do with the way the engine fits inside the engine bay. You move everything back two inches and that means you have to get your rear drive shaft shortened by two inches and the front one lengthened by two inches. It, it is what it is. Once again, there's no way around that. If there was a way around it, I would have tried to find it. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? We have a Cummins conversion bearing. There we go. Ford Cummins conversion bearing. That is an NSK 6303. Yeah, that's it. Easy as that. So, yeah, I've tried to make this as complete as possible. I realize it's a dry video. It's more educational than anything. But this stuff is stuff you got to learn. And for me, it's easy because I've done it before. Uh, myself and Peg, this is nothing to us because it's been done. But to people that have never done it before, it could be probably a daunting task. And a lot of the videos online are an hour long. And there's a lot of talk and not a lot of action and not a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, progress where they show little bits here and there and you're always searching through it i tried to make it as complete as possible uh you're also going to have to build your intercooler piping to the intercooler once again there's no way around this i've already built one of the pipes the one that goes from here to there because i measured off that truck but it doesn't work for my tip particular conversion because that truck is a p-pump so it's here the inlet to the engine and on that one, it's different. So I can't build that one ahead of time. I have to build it in the truck. Uh, I kept all the old parts from the swap. So I have the parts. It's not an issue. Yeah. In the end, you're going to be left over with a bunch of parts, a bunch of parts that you can't use. But if you're lucky, maybe you can recoup some of your money online with, uh, with uh, Craigslist in the States or Kijiji in Canada, whatever it is you choose. Anyway, hopefully this is useful in some way, shape or form. I get that. You know, it's not a really hands-on video. This is mostly an explanation. Hopefully someone can pick their way through it and use the bits and pieces to help them along their way. Good luck, guys.